You're listening to Seattle Real Estate Podcast. Hey, everybody. I'm Sean Reynolds, the owner of Summer Properties Northwest, Reynolds and Client Appraisal, and your host of this episode of the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. And today I have with me two Summer Properties Northwest brokers. They are the owners of Team Scott. They are located in Snohomish County, just a little bit north of where we are here in Bellevue, Washington. So Jim and Denise Scott, welcome to the Seattle Real Estate Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. And what are we going to talk about today? Well, we have a lot of questions in regards to uh, the power of the appraiser and okay. how, what the overall appraisal questions, uh, the overall process, and what you uh, is used for valuations. Right. And um, we've been in it for 10 years as real estate agents. And so when we go out and do a listing, we have our process of how we come up with a home valuation and been in it for, like I said, 10 years, but yet we still have a lot of questions ourselves. And we even reached out to folks on our social media and they brought up some really good, interesting questions that we brought along with us as well. Yep. So we've basically got a question and answer session. You guys are going to ask the questions. Yep. And then because I have a background in appraising also, we're going to talk about that. We're gonna. I, when I saw these questions, I was like, "Yeah, we should do a podcast on that because these are questions that literally come up all the time." They do. Homeowners have them. Real estate brokers have them. Yep. Other managing brokers hit me up too. They're like, oh, "I got this really tricky property. Here's a situation." And I think these questions um, they cover such a large spectrum of. And I'm just gonna. We're not gonna get into it right away, but I'm gonna throw out a couple so that the viewers and the listeners can kind of get an idea of what we're going to talk about. How much does multiple offers play into valuing a home when comps are low? Super great question. Yeah. Can a stick built be used to comp a manufactured home on, on uh, land? That's an awesome question. Can a two story or tri-level or split be used to compare to a rambler? These are all questions people have all the time throughout the appraisal process and even appraisers have a question like, what do I do? What do I do here? Oh, one of my favorites is when I go out to a listing appointment and they've all done their research with Zillow or Redfin and they've got what, you know, in their mind what their home's worth. And then we bring in the actual comps for the surrounding area and there's a disconnect. Um, so. You've used your experience to bring in the set of comps that you think are relevant. Yep. And then the homeowner is looking at a, a national AVM, whether it's Redfin or right, you know Zillow or whatever, and they're like, "Hey, but Zillow said my house is worth this, right?" And you guys are saying this. What's the deal? A lot of people don't quite get the fact that getting a buyer is one thing, but getting the home to appraise for the lender perspective uh, is a totally different. And at, at the end of the day, that's what we're shooting for. And it's super critical, considering a lot of times we don't have enough comps to really be able to hammer home the value. And we don't have, and that's because we haven't had enough supply in a lot of these markets. Yep. So let's jump on in, Jim, and why don't All you right. just hit me up as you see fit, and we'll start talking about some, some topics. Want to trade off? Sure, I'll start. Spending $800, why would I even need an appraisal? I have a market buyer willing to pay that price. Right, so the buyer has a, the buyer's got a contract, and the seller is like, why are we doing an appraisal? And the buyer is like, why are we doing an appraisal? Why do I need an appraisal? I just want to buy this home. And so if the buyer is getting any kind of financing at all, their lender is going to require it, whether that's Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, VA, USDA. And so it's not really up to the people, the principals in the transaction. You got to have one if you're going to get financing. If you pay cash, you can do whatever you want. You can spend your money however you want. So it does seem like a lot of money, but it's part of the process. And it's because the lender wants to know that they are lending you an appropriate amount of money on the asset that they're going to take as collateral until you pay it off. So it's, it's, a, it's a necessary evil. <laughs> until such time as AVMs get to the point where they are so dialed in that a bank can go, let's press a button and figure out value. And then like you and I were talking about, Denise, the AVMs haven't seen the inside of the home. Right. And so that's where the disconnect between a Zillow and an appraisal is. The appraiser actually goes into the home. They drive by the outside of all the comps 
and they get a real clear-cut idea or a better idea than what you can get by looking online. All right. Thank you. Uh, how much does the age of a home play into being a viable comp? I know I like I got homes that are like say a 1994, and I've got the surrounding uh, comps that have sold recently. We got like a lot of new construction going on. Yep. Um, how you know how does a new construction or something that's in 2015, 2016 are those viable comps for a home that's 1994? Um. You're going to probably make some adjustments because no matter what you do to a home built in 1994, it has already gone undergone some physical depreciation that you can't get rid of. And so even if it's in fairly similar condition, yeah. buyers always going to buy that new construction home. They're going to go to that new construction home. Yeah, they home. want the bells and whistles. They want the bells and whistles. They right. want new. They want to be able to say, I've got a new construction home. Right. So is it a viable comp? Yes, you can use it, but you're probably going to make some sort of adjustment for it. So if you've got a new construction home, you want to use new construction comps. That's ideal. If you don't have other new construction comps and you've only got resale homes, you want to use as new a resale home as you can get. You're going to make some small adjustments. If you've got a new construction home as your subject and you've only got old homes, then you're going to probably make some pretty big adjustments and maybe you expand your market area out until you do hit some new construction comps. Okay. And then you got to figure out, okay, are those locations fairly similar or do I need to make some adjustments here to make these similar? What would you say as a rule of thumb for a home that is like 1994 and say I've got a whole selection of comps, can I use 2004, a 10 year old home or a 10 year older home, 1984? Are, I mean, is there kind of a rule of thumb of an age that could be all? What does a, what, when a buyer is looking in that marketplace, what are they thinking? Like how much of a discount are they going to give to the 1984 home versus the new construction home? That's what you're trying to measure. So the more similar a home you can get okay. for your piece of data, the better. Okay. And so if you've got something wildly outside of what your subject is, then you have to realize that that piece of data isn't necessarily as reliable as a comparable sale that's more similar. So that's why you see a lot of times you might have one comp in the appraisal that's really similar and all the weight is placed on that. Even though you have way higher comps and way lower comps of dissimilar homes, all the weight gets placed on the most similar. Okay. Because that's where a buyer, that's what a buyer kind of kind of sees and we're looking at this from the standpoint of what a, a reasonable buyer and a reasonable seller would pay for the home and sell the home for and that's your definition of market value okay so i guess that kind of goes into play in in regards to uh does an older home with stick frame trusses where they built them on site versus the engineered trusses of today uh come into play in, in valuation it really it's based off of the age of the home more so than the trust. And how design. are how are buyers in that marketplace going to view an older stick built home versus an engineered trust home? Gotcha. Some people are going to say, "Hey, stick built home built 1950, that's way more solid than a home oh, built yeah. in 2016." Yeah. So we want that one. Yeah. But usually there's trends that you can identify in the comparable sales that say, nah, buyers want this new home because it's got better insulation, it's got better green factor, it's, it's, it's got the granite mar the top right. countertops, right. it's got all the bells and whistles. But the age of a home, also, these days we're getting so densely put together. The older homes are have actual distance between their neighbors, have more land, have the yard and everything else. Doesn't that factor in instead of just the... But, but those homes are further out, right? Because now the densely want built ones are closer in. And people want closer in, and people in today's market don't necessarily want a big yard to maintain. We are proving that time and time and time again. People don't go outside. Especially in Washington, where you really can't for almost like 10 months a year. <laughs> they go to Arizona instead, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. Amen. <laughs> 
And I give you guys a hard time on that because you are now licensed real estate agents in Arizona, Arizona yeah. as well. Yeah. Just him. And okay, just just you, Jim. And yeah. you've got uh, you've got property down there now as well. We do. Yeah. yeah. What what area of Arizona? So, uh, we basically st- stay focused in uh, Sun City West area. Okay. So it's Sun City, Sun City West, Surprise, Peoria. It's basically kind of the west to northwest area of of Phoenix. Of Phoenix. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It is smoking hot there right now. It is. It's the number one in the nation in appreciation. Yeah. yeah, it's. It's. I don't know if it's the demo, my our sphere, uh, but it does seem kind of odd that a lot of people are cashing in out of Washington and going to Arizona. If you look at it, it's, a it's, it's affordable. It's got some great weather. Yeah. It's got the dry weather that you need when the bones start to yep. creak and. Yes. Uh, yep. And it's not that long of a flight. No, it's, it's uh, and taxes. A lot of it's for taxes. Yeah. Uh, California and Washington are all seeing that where it's just mass exodus. Yeah. People just kind of get to the point where they've had enough. It's time to retire. They sell out and go south. They, they go somewhere else where the sunshine is. Yep. Because yeah. who can blame them? Oh, and no. it's flat. We get up in the morning and go for a walk. Sunrises. At the sunrise, it's just awesome. It's amazing. I was I was telling you guys I flew down there for a haircut like I don't know maybe a month ago, right in the middle of all this chaos, and I stayed in um, Scottsdale. Yeah. Pretty far out in Scottsdale, and from the airport to Scottsdale, I think it was a forty-minute drive to the place I was staying. <coughs> I had two turns, the entire way. One was one freeway, a right and a left. And I ended up where I needed to be. It's everything so flat and so just kind of dialed in. Did you notice? I shouldn't give too much of a tangent. Uh, the highways, I just everything seems to be bigger. I mean, they've it's almost designed to grow into versus. They've got the land to do it. Yeah, it's just like Dallas. How opposite? They've just whereas we're here in Seattle, we're so packed in that if you move the freeway, you are literally. Eliminating by condemnation so many in eminent domain, so many people's homes, that it's just like, well, we can't do it. Don't have that ability. Yeah. It's crazy. All right, what's your next one? Um, you want to nail that okay. one? How far out in radius can an appraiser go, especially with property involved? Right, so home on acreage. Um, the underwriters will allow you to go out as far out as you need within reason. If a buyer is looking at acreage in a rural neighborhood, you might be able to go out 10 miles. Wow. If you're in downtown Seattle or say Capitol Hill, yeah, it might be half a mile because neighborhoods change so quickly in an urban setting. Wow. Whereas rural, all right, so you're five miles out, you're seven miles out, you're still 20 miles away from your employment center, right? So it doesn't really matter. Whereas within the downtown urban neighborhoods, things change so quickly. Whereas acreage is acreage is acreage further out. Now, if you get into different taxation districts or different cities, then you got to look at that. So on acreage, if you're far out, you might, you might have comps that are five, 10 mile radius. And as long as those homes are pretty similar, if you think about the radius your buyers might look at on a big acreage property, say a 10 acre property somewhere, they go all over creation, don't they? Oh yeah. They're gonna have you search. And so that's the mindset of what is a buyer gonna look at? That's the kind of mindset we as appraisers have to be thinking at because that's what determines your value. Okay. So as far as you need to within reason, if you can support it in an appraisal, and that's as far out as you can go. And that's a judgment call. If you're doing like a standard cookie cutter, you know, three bedroom, three, two, three bedroom, two bath, two car garage, uh, Snohomish County. In you a know, suburban ever, setting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Less than a mile, okay. typically. Try and keep it less than a mile. If you go two miles in a suburban setting, yeah. oftentimes you're into different neighborhoods. Okay. And then things change. And okay. then you're back to comparing apples to oranges. Okay. And so you don't, that's what you're trying to avoid. You're trying to go with the most similar and you guys have seen where sellers are like, but look at these comps over here. These support such a higher value. And you're like, yeah, but That's you've got these area. comps. It's a different community. Different there. community. Yeah. How about the one next door and the one across the street yeah. that sold for this? Well, we don't like those because those sold for less. Right. That's usually your bottom line. It's like, why didn't you use these? Because uh, we didn't really like them. 
and that, you know, yeah, that's just kind of how buyers or uh, sellers operate so okay. often. Yeah. Uh, one of the, when I'm pulling up comps, I, I know it plays a, uh, a variable and I just don't know how much. Uh, so you're comping out a Rambler. Am I able to use a two story, a tri level, or a split? And if, or am I supposed to make adjustments for the, the comps if right. I do? Yeah, so Rambler versus two story versus a tri level or a split entry. A lot of people listening to this may not know what a split entry is, but it's where you go in, in the, you walk up a flight of stairs, you go, and then you go in an entry, kind of a landing area, and you can either go up or you can go down. That's a split. And so, can we compare those? And it really depends on what your market is, but preferably for a Rambler, you want to use other Rambler comps. Okay. Oftentimes you don't have that. No. So because a Rambler is all above grade, use other above grade homes, like maybe a two story. Now buyers who are looking for a two story pretty much just want a two story because they want to have their bedrooms and baths up and their living room, dining room, kitchen, half bath, utility garage on the main floor. Okay. So they want to have that separation. Now, buyers who are looking for a Rambler, they don't want to probably deal with stairs. No, exactly. So they're not going to probably look at a two-story. But Ramblers are so rare because they're so expensive to build. Right. Builders can't make as much money on them, even though they're really desirable. So if you can, use a Rambler. Next in priority would be a two-story. Now, when you start getting into tri-levels or splits, those have areas that are below grade. So the lower level on a split entry is what we consider below grade. That's below the dirt line. Right. And think of nobody wants to live in a basement. So those areas get discounted. So, yeah. So I noticed, I noticed that when it's the, the below grade. Yep. Uh, and that's, kind of a, that's directly on the appraisal. Wildly separated out main level or above grade area versus below grade. Two totally separate areas on the appraisal. And that's because statistically, above grade area, anything above the dirt line is worth so much more than below below air below grade area. Wow! Even if it was like on a on a hill where it's like a daylight basement per se. Especially on a hill, because that means all of that area is probably below grade. Yeah, they're all same, less one variable. One's below grade, one's above grade. Yep. Why would there be such a difference in valuation and i yeah i I, because people don't want that below they they pay way less for the below grade area all right just time and time and time again you extrapolate it from the marketplace so a split entry the below grade area the lower level family room typically bedroom and call it bathroom yeah maybe a laundry room those are discounted severely okay so use split entry comps so you can use tri-levels for split entry comps vice versa but when you start to compare a rambler to a split you're comparing apples to oranges on a square footage basis okay good to know uh let me hit that one can you use a stick build to use can a stick build be used as a comp for a manufactured home on the same land that's a really good question and I'll start with saying a lot of times you don't have a choice in an appraisal. And that's why you see stick builts so often, especially here in Washington, because our land is so expensive that there's very few manufactured homes left. Everybody builds a stick built. So if you've got a manufactured home that you're appraising, you want to use other manufactured homes because it's comparing, again, apples to oranges. If you compare a stick built home and stick built for people who don't know what that is, it's just when the framers go out there and literally build it piece by piece instead of a, you know, a moving truck building, you know, dropping the home off in two sections and then a crew puts it together. Right. Like in the way that a manufactured home is or a single wide, they just move right on in, take off the trailer, take off the hitch and go. So you, oftentimes you will see stick built homes in appraisals because the appraiser doesn't have any other data to use. And they've got to have some sort of data to develop their their uh, estimate of value. And so you will see oftentimes, we were talking about this earlier, oftentimes you will see a couple of comps as manufactured homes. Those will usually be like comps one and two. And then maybe comps three, four, five, and six are stick built. And that's usually because they didn't have any other comps that were relevant. If they had six comps that were all manufactured home comps, they okay. would go with that. Gotcha. 
Now, because you're, you, you're comparing apples to oranges, not a lot of weight is placed on a stick-built home if you're appraising a manufactured home. Okay. And you're going to have some quality and appeal adjustments. Exactly. To the point where it's not really a relevant comp. But the lender is going to say, if you turn in an appraisal without enough comps that are either within proximity of your subject or don't have the date of sale, maybe you're in an area where there's been very low supply, which is across the country right now. So you've got an issue where you just don't have enough comps. You've got to have enough comps. And so the lender is going to say, the appraiser knows when he turns in that report, the lender is going to come back and say, we need three more comps that are within the last six months of the last year. So you do have to go back further distance to Maybe you go out further distance, maybe you go back in time, whatever you got to do to do that. That's a good question. So I know normally it's six months. Yep. Yeah. So if you were to go back in time, is there kind of a, are you able to do a year or a year? I mean, how far is, of a stretch more are you allowed to go? Right. So how far back do you need to go to get relevant data? Uh. All right. And then if the market has moved, like the Seattle market moves all the time right. up, you may need to make some time adjustments to those older comps to bring oh, that bring current. them up. Gotcha. And, okay. But when we do that, the lender wants to see some real support because they're going to go, ah, you're just making this adjustment. What are you doing? Well, the market's appreciating. That's fine. Prove it. Gotcha. So that's kind of the process we go through. We're in, when we're in a super hot market, you will have upward time adjustments. And then the thing that people hate is when we're in a downward market, we make downward time adjustments. So those older comps get adjusted down because they sold in a market that was hotter. Oh, right. People don't like to see that because that brings their property values down. Uh, not good. We want right. more. We always want more. Always. More is better. Absolutely. <laughs> Unless... Unless you're appealing your taxes, right, yeah. and, and then less is different better. ball game. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we don't we don't pay attention to Zillow at that point. Yeah, which is a kind of a good question: is uh, how close would you say the accuracy of Zillow uh, and Redfin are to uh, you know a, a evaluation of a home? That, right, the, in your the, experiences, yeah, you've been finding. The, the, and I've done a, a bunch of videos on that. And in a dense uh, suburban or urban neighborhood where there's a lot of data and a lot of cookie cutter homes, they can be very accurate. But in the Seattle market, greater Seattle market, you don't have many neighborhoods like that. We were talking about Klahani earlier. Snohomish County as Snohomish well. Snohomish County as well. Yeah. And my main appraiser up there, Nathan Morello, he was continuously running into issues because he doesn't have comps or he's got a weird property or something. And so anything outside of the box, Zillow and, U and uh, Redfin are typically not accurate on. They can be wildly inaccurate because they don't have enough data to run their AVM models. Being the auto, auto valuation. Gotcha. Yeah, automated valuation yep. model. Yeah. And, and, you know, we have that in Realist in our tax records. Yep. You can go online. Homeowners get those. And unless you've had an appraiser go through your home, it's kind of a crapshoot on whether you're going to get an accurate valuation. You just don't really know because they can they don't take into account the the condition and condition they may not take into account that it's across the street from a 7-eleven the location it's next door to a freeway they yep. may not be able to see that they're just plugging in tax records to their model right. now if you look at zillow they do an incredible job because they do evaluation on every single home in the united states it's a pretty massive massive endeavor so i give them credit there but then a lot of times i think their stuff is it's it's inaccurate well we had like i was just sharing earlier we had our we have a duplex in marysville it was like 385 and we ended up selling it for six and a quarter um so it's a little bit off it's yeah quite yeah. a bit yeah yeah. We're, on the, we're on the good side of that. And Zillow, yeah. uh, Zillow, those models can't see market demand at the time that you put the home on the market either. How many other available homes are there? Well, there's none, and you've got a feeding frenzy on your hands. Right. House is going to go for more. Right. So. Which is a good question. Um, that one there on the multiple offer one. Okay. Back to multiple offers then. Yeah. This feeding frenzy going on. Now. Yeah. How much multiple offers play into valuating a home when the comps in the area are lower? That's a really good one. And I've got, that's one of our best videos that I've done is multiple offer situation, but low appraisal. 
And that happens all the time because you've got such demand for this home and people escalate the home up so high beyond what any comps support it. So you've got to have closed comps in the appraisal process because if you think about it, an active listing, all that is is basically what a home won't sell for if it's been on the market for a while. It's just sitting there. Somebody's going to make an offer less than active. A pending sale, that is under contract, but that pending sale could flip. Agreed. So closed sales are your only data. If you've got a low supply market, you may not have many closed sales, but there's such demand, especially coming out of the coronavirus, there's such demand for buyers that they are jumping on stuff. And in certain markets, you might only have a couple of sales like a couple of months back. So that's kind of the question, though, is so if you've got a home that the comps are showing 875. Yep. And I've got multiple offers, let's yep. say five or 10. Yep. Does those multiple offers uh, and say, I, you know, went to nine and a quarter was my. Yep. Do those multiple offers uh, help show demand? And does they it do. weigh into the decision of maybe nine and a quarter, 900 uh, valuation? You've still got to have the data to support your number. Whatever number you come up with, you've got to have closed sales that support that. You can put in the appraisal that there were nine offers and it escalated from 875 to nine and a quarter. But unless you have the data in the report to say it's worth oh. nine and a quarter, you got to have the comps because the okay. lender is going to go, yeah, we don't really care about that because okay. we don't base. What if those, what if eight of those buyers are just nut jobs that are making crazy offers based on nothing? Okay. That's what the lenders thinking is they're, they're you know they're lending upwards of call it 700 grand, 800 grand. Right. They want to see data in the appraisal that supports your nine and a quarter. Okay. But it does go in so as appraisers yes. we look at it and go there's nine people that made this offer. This thing's probably worth it. And I have literally turned in appraisals and called the lender or called whomever and said this thing is worth it, but I can't support it. Oh happens fairly often Excellent. okay it happens and the reason is is you don't have data to support it you've got such market demand and that's because there's no inventory they've got nothing else to look at you got a feeding frenzy on your hands because when what's the number one reason something sells for more is because people can't have it and they want what they can't have <laughs> so what happens in that situation where the lender uh go ahead and stretch and and uh continue giving a loan on the home with the, the with lender is going to lend call it 80 percent of whatever the uh, appraised value is right not the purchase okay. price all right so if the buyer still wants to pay the purchase price right they bring in the difference okay or the seller lowers the price or the seller lowers the price right it creates an issue but we, you know in the northwest multiple listing service in our mls you've got appraisal addendums that identify the process and that happened because of the multiple offer situation. We didn't used to have those forms. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. Didn't have those forms. We didn't used to have multiple offers. Didn't happen. We didn't have escalation clauses in the MLS. That form didn't exist. Oh. I've been every, yeah. 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 It's because the inventory's got So, it yeah. <laughs> Big city problems. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. So that, uh, and then um, in regards to minus in and adding uh, in a valuation of a home, let's say yep. you're looking at a, bed, a home that's a three bedroom, two bath, you're looking at a home that's three bedroom, one bath, uh, how much do you plus or minus for a bathroom or for an updated kitchen or a two car garage without a garage? And so again, you're gonna put yourself in the mindset of a buyer in that specific neighborhood. So if you've got a three bedroom, one bath home and you've got three kids, you're probably not going to buy the one bath home. You're going to buy that two bath home, right? Okay. So ideally you want to use like for like, or at least have one comp in there. And that comp is what you're going to put your weight on. But if I was to make an evaluation, you know, I, I'm the listing, I'm listing a yep. three bedroom, one bath. Yep. And there's a three bedroom, two bath as yep. my comps. Yep. Uh, how much am I able to, to, or should I minus out f for a bathroom or for a remodeled kitchen or 
or garage. What, what price point are you at? Let's say the standard up in Stonebridge County is right. It seems to be about four hundred. Yep. Mid four hundred. So for a bathroom, so think about it this way. The, the structure of a home, you've got the home and it's square footage, right? Yeah. You're already making square footage adjustments. Right. Okay. So what if you have a larger three-bedroom, one-bath home than a smaller three-bedroom, two-bath home? You're going to adjust the larger home down for square footage, but then you're going to adjust it back up for bath count. So you got to kind of factor that in. Okay. And what is a buyer going to pay for that extra bathroom? Probably, you know, anywhere from five grand to ten grand to maybe twenty grand. Holy cow! Well, think about it. If you have one bathroom and you've got two two teenage daughters. Oh yeah. <laughs> are you going to pay twenty grand to have another bathroom? Probably. Yeah. Jim, yeah. the answer is yes. yes we have <laughs> I'm cheap. <laughs> 20 grand. Uh, I'll just kind of wait for y'all. But so 20 grand, but then you might not pay for 20 grand. But if you're like a big car guy, you might pay 30 grand. For uh, that that's shop. a different ball game. I'll different, pay for the so, shop. So the man cave. Yeah. Right. You're on board with the man cave. Yeah. yeah. So all of this. And she won't be. And she won't be. She could care less other than it's a place to send him. Yeah. When he's not behaving. I'll pay for the shop. She'll pay for the bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's a matter of trying to figure out what does a typical purchaser pay. And then so you get into like big homes, 5,000 square, square foot homes. Mm -hmm. Bedroom and bathrooms don't really matter so much because you've already got so many. Right. Four bedrooms versus five bedrooms yeah, yeah. versus six bedrooms. You make, an, you make an adjustment. I mean, a 10 bedroom home, who needs that? It's excessive. We all know it. Over the top. Yeah. And so, unless you're running a hotel. Yeah. Yeah, unless you're, you're running a boarding house. Right. Well, and then you don't have a bathroom on each level. I mean, of all the bathrooms are just upstairs. There is none on the bottom. That's an issue. Are you going to have people living down there? Nope. It's kitchen and living room. But there's, you would want one to have a guest room. Sure. For yeah. Yeah. And so that's why you oftentimes see the older homes with those floor plan configurations with this weird half bath made out of a closet right. or whatever. And you're like, yeah, they added a half bath because the market now dictates need that extra bathroom. Bathroom on every floor. And this, let's see what this house built in 1954. Yeah, we're coming out of uh, World War II. <laughs> you know, times are different then. Yeah. You see those little two bedroom, one bath homes that are post World War II. I mean, they just wanted a home. They were minimal. Yeah. You needed enough for that one kid because you're going to move up. And you had your home. You got the American dream. Yep. Now the American dream is a lot more. Oh, my God. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. The big thing up north is uh, three-story homes. They can't just put it all on, you know, a two-story. You got to... Yeah. And then small lots. Tiny lots. It's crazy. Tiny lots. And we started to see that in um, Seattle years ago. And for, as appraisers, we love those homes because there's two measurements front and back and they're oh. square <laughs> versus these big offset angles offset right. garages right. you have to get out your angle you know measurement tool yep and those are a nightmare but if you got these urban you know flat roof things shoebox yeah those are super easy to to measure and usually they're in areas where you got lots of comps mm -hmm. so it's kind of like all right that's pretty easy all right this is your question. Okay. And, and we talked about bathroom. Yeah. We did talk about kitchen. Kitchen. Yeah. Oh, kitchen. Oh, then we can also, and then we can also have that other one, uh, the question in regards to how a laminate countertop plays into granite countertop. Right. So let's start with the kitchen. So how much would you add, minus or add for a kitchen? So you're talking about maybe an accessory dwelling unit within the home Something like that. Oh, well, it was like you know, it was something in the in the '90s or the '80s, and they they didn't do the cabinets, but or some do. They redid the kitchen with new cabinets and granite oh, okay. countertop. Okay, talk about kitchen remodel. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So that goes into the overall condition of the home, and two of the questions you're always going to hear from an appraiser because they are on the Fannie Mae form, the 1004 form, is has the bathrooms been updated? If so, when? Oh. Has the kitchen been updated? If so, when? And we literally put that on the report. 
And it's because that has such an impact on value and the overall condition of the property. What do you call update? If they just put granite question. countertops on laminate, is that called an update? Or do they have to change all the cupboards? What is typical for the neighborhood for that age of a okay. home? Probably big remodel, I would guess. Probably new cabinets, new counters, new appliances, new flooring. Okay. Something along those lines. That's full mail deal? Full mail deal, yeah. yeah. <coughs> Depending on, you know, if the home was built in the 80s and maybe you got those really dark cabinets that are just horrific. Yeah. Maybe you swap those out. and But you, you compare that to a home with a full you know kitchen remodel, you spend a lot of money in a kitchen remodel. Oh, you can go crazy with go it. Go crazy. We see that all the time in these tiny little kitchens. And you're like, you spent 50 grand on that? That's brutal. You're not going to get that back. You're not going to get that back. Yeah. But you want to keep that comment to yourself. <laughs> yeah, just. Well, no, I, I, I have people call me a year in advance for selling a home yep. to find out exactly what is the best bang for their buck and i look at the laminates first yep. and say um let's refresh these kitchen cabinets and let's put some granite or quartz or find out some sort of other countertop and backsplash because you want to bring this home into this century and on a cost basis you want to do it as as efficiently as possible not spend a ton of money Spend within what the market typically spends. Mm -hmm. What are your neighbors spending on their kitchen remodels? Do that. Don't do more than that. Right. Don't do significantly less. Bring it up to the standards that a buyer wants in that neighborhood, right. and you're good to go. And so that's what we base it on. When we have people you know, meet us at the front door and say, I use Brazilian hardwood, <laughs> and you know the brand names start rolling off their tongue, all I can think of is, you spent more money than you should have because <laughs> we're not in a neighborhood where that's gonna, you're gonna get that back. Recapture, yeah. yeah. So what, and, and, I, and I jokingly say, keep your mouth closed when people spend, say they spent all that money. That's when it's already been done. Yeah. Right. right. There's no point of return at that point. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times we'll get called in to look at people's plans and specs for a remodel or a proposed construction. Hey, what do you think of our spec list? We're spending this on this. And a lot of times we got to say, you know, scale that back because you're not you're spending X Y Z. House is worth X Y Z on the other end. If you're going to be there forever, great. If not, but how often does somebody get sick? How often does a divorce happen? How often does a relocation happen? A lot of variables. Can't tell you how many times I've been on somebody's front porch where the wife is crying and saying, "My husband's divorcing me. We got to sell the house." And they spent a ton of money on either building it or remodeling it. And you're like, wow, I'm sorry. That's a terrible scenario, but the market doesn't care because it is what it is. And it sounds kind of heartless, but money's money and you got to be smart about it. So have at least a five year game plan is what I always tell people, because then if you've got your exit strategy, you're OK. Yeah. It's so often you hear, this is my forever home, and it's just not. But if they're just trying to put on the best kitchen update, where do I tell them, don't worry about it? We'll just factor that in and let the next buyer update the kitchen? Oh, it, so, the, so the buyer is, so you are counseling the buyer. I'm counseling the seller. You're counseling the seller, sorry. To get the most bang for their buck. Yep. And their kitchen laminate is their concern. So should they go to uh, quartz or granite? How much money are they spending? Does their market warrant it? That's the question. I would say go with an economical, mm -hmm. yet nice looking, desirable looking. So when you walk into the kitchen, you go, oh, this is nicely updated. But don't spend a horrific amount of money because nobody really knows. I think our our market is different in, in Snohomish County where you got Everett, Marysville, Arlington, Lake Stevens, Snohomish, versus Bellevue, Seattle, yes, yes. Redmond, Issaquah. It, there's just, it's, you're gonna, we're not going to get the bang for the buck up there as you will down here. Your sales prices and your values are less. And as a result, you have less margin to operate within. Right. Agreed. So you can't spend fifty grand, whereas fifty grand on a kitchen or seventy-five grand on a kitchen, 
Whereas in a million dollar home here in Bellevue, which is it's either expected. it's either a tear down or a starter. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's crazy. We see it all the time. Fifty grand into a kitchen and then the bulldozer hits it, tear it down. Oh, wow. That's you know, it's land uh, urban land yeah. economics. Yeah. So it's kind of where the demand is. Uh, your million dollar question. Okay. I want to know if you have a fence and a deck and a pool all with solar panels feeding the water to the pool, even if it's an above ground pool, is that going to have any benefit in pricing in value? In the Pacific Northwest, how many months out of the year can you use a pool? How much are you going to spend maintaining that above ground pool, keeping it up, heating the water for those two months? That's what the solar panels heat the water. You got to maintain the solar panels as well. They are expensive to maintain. Okay. Windstorm comes through, rips a couple off. You can spend a ton of money doing that. Okay. So does the market warrant it is the question. And there's not a lot of pools around here. So, I mean, and being an above ground... So often we will see in-ground pools get filled in because buyers in the Pacific Northwest, they realize her first couple of years, this is sweet. I have a pool. This is awesome. I love it. Year two, man, look at my budget. <laughs> this is difficult. Yeah. So for above ground pools, another thing to consider is that that is oftentimes considered personal property because you can oh. drain the pool and you can move it. That is correct. Right? So it's not even really a fixture. So we happen to have a listing that's got this beautiful deck all around it. Okay. That pool ain't coming out. Okay. Yeah. So it's there. Yeah. So I would give it some value, yeah. but not a ton. Yeah. Okay. What price point are you at? About 600. 600? Yeah. Nice deck, nice pool. It's above ground pool? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice, mm-hmm. nice, large. You could probably get away with, you know, adding 20 grand for value, 25 grand for value if okay. it's warranted. Okay. If it's got some other features. If it's really nice and it's it's an appeal, it's like an outdoor living area. Yeah. 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 No, they've done a beautiful job with yeah. it. Master Gardner yeah. made yeah. a beautiful property. Yeah. So, but, but then you got to look at the feedback you get initially on that listing and realize, okay, are people going to pay a premium for this or are they going to say no go? Because you've kind of limited your marketplace. You're going to be looking at buyers who want that pool. Right. And they're, they're all going to Arizona. Yeah. No. It, it, <laughs> yeah. A pool is not, a, is not a, uh, a nice city, as I call it, in the state of Washington. Right. Hot it's, tub? Different, diff- yeah. different thing. Yeah. A lot of people use hot tub because yeah. in the winter, that sounds pretty good. Sport court in the Northwest? Yeah. Kind of in the middle there. Great Send area. your kids outside, you know. Uh, shop, those are always have some value. Definitely. Shop, garage, those kind of things. Solar panels oftentimes don't add a lot of value because aesthetically people don't want to have them on their roof. They're like, what's that weird stuff? Oh, that's a solar panel. And you got to maintain them again. So on like a pool, oftentimes we will do like a negative adjustment because they don't have much value. And so people are discounting them. People with little kids don't want the liability right. having their kids drown in a pool because how often do you hear that oh constantly it's the first thing a mom it's the first thing a mom would say you know they're going to want a fence around it and well, the neighborhood kids or they liability fill, they fill it in yeah 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 okay. all right um one of our social media guys uh reached out and was wanting to know which great question is there a point where improvements outdo the neighborhood or where the return invested uh, won't get back in the sale? And how do you know when that is? So you, what you do is, so you're talking about doing like a proposed remodel on a home and we do those all the time. All right. The buyer is buying this home and they're proposing to putting 150 grand in and we think it'll be worth X, Y, Z. So you got the purchase price, plus the price of the improvements needs to be worth at least what it's worth in the future. Hopefully it's worth more. So you've got some profit in there, especially on a fix and flip. So if those two components, the purchase price and the improvements don't at least add up to the future value, 
then the answer is don't do it unless you think it's going to appreciate and then you are betting on something that we can't quantify. What if a worldwide pandemic hits and it goes on for a long time and the real estate market isn't as strong as it is, say right now, you're host. Yeah. So just got to run your numbers and know where you're at. So often people will go ahead and do their remodel out of pocket and then we get called in because they run out of budget and they're like, we need a hundred grand more in value. And the appraiser will say, well, you surpassed that long ago. You're out of luck. Wow. Happens all the time. Wow. Because they've outspent their budget. Okay. The yeah. Are they just sitting there holding the bag or are they just the projects over and they borrow from family and friends, try and do a refinance down the road, gotcha. sell it. Wow. Yeah. That's why you'll see homes sit for four, five, six years, half done. You ran out of money. Brutal. Yeah, for sure. I didn't quite understand the gist of what they were trying to say on this one. What is the most common overlooked flaw in a home that you're appraising? Yeah, and the first thing that jumped into my mind was a bad roof. Ah, yes. Bad roof. Yes, they're, yes, yes. They're expensive, and people put that off as long as they can. Yes, they and do. And how many times have you had the conversation with the seller? That roof looks like it's at the end of its years. Yeah, we we're just going to handle that when we sold it. We didn't want to pay for it because they're, they're really expensive. So bad roof is the number one thing. Um, bad deck, probably the number two thing here in the Pacific Northwest. Wood rots outside, doesn't do well. And then maybe out of date uh, paint colors. That's an easy one to fix. Oh. Carpeting, bad carpet. That's cosmetic. But how about that hot water heater? I mean, see those all the time. Because they forget. All the time. They forget. Hey, we're looking for eighty-five to ninety percent efficiencies these days, and those old heaters aren't being maintained. No, and the old heaters will will they will last forever, and they're so far beyond their warranty. And then guess what? Two weeks in after the buyer buys it, hot water tank blew up. <laughs> and how often does that happen? Uh, more times than I care to. I know. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 So if you can address that hot water tank, because that's an easy fix. Yeah. It might be, what is it, 1500 bucks? Furnace. The, yeah, furnace. Yeah. Furnace, another one. You know, you've got a couple a, grand. A couple of grand. 2500 yeah. Yeah. And those things, when they go sideways on a new buyer. Uh, yeah, we took a listing in Lake Stevens. And uh, we drove up, and that's the first thing that kind of came to my mind. This roof, it is gone. It, it was missing shingles. I mean, it was like, so when we did our presentation, <laughs> that was the first thing. It was like, you did a beautiful, and then ironically, they did a beautiful job updating the home on the inside. I mean, it was gorgeous inside. That was kind of their last project that they didn't even get to. As appraisers, we drive down a street and we know kind of roughly where the ho our house is going to be. And you'll be looking, you're like, please don't let it be that one. Please don't <laughs> let it be. Oh, it's that one. It's the one with the roof that's blown apart. And you're like, okay, before you get out of your car, you know you're going to have to call for that roof because the lender is going to look at it and go, this is a bad roof. We're not lending on it. Gotcha. And we're, as appraisers, we're the eyes of the lender. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and you can usually tell when it's a bad roof. Um, even sometimes the roof is maybe not physically, there's nothing wrong with it, but you know, it's 25 years. It probably had a roof life of 20. It's at the end of its life right. should be replaced. It's not leaking yet, but any day now days are numbered because it rains a lot in the Pacific Northwest and those roofs don't last forever. Jim, what about the, uh, the require the what's required today to become an appraiser? Yeah. That's a really good one. Yeah. Talk about that? Yeah. 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 So I have people come to me all the time so and say, I want to be an appraiser. So I know back when the housing crash, Dodd-Frank redid a lot of the rules and regulations. Yeah. And I know the appraisals was a big one. Yeah. Um, it eliminated all of my relationships with my clients. It eliminated my sphere of business overnight. Wow. Because I know you back in the day, a lender could just call you and say, yep. hey, Sean, I got this home. Yep. Eight, 850. Yep. Can you, can you appraise it? Make it happen. Yep. And oh, hey, Sean, this appraisal came back a little low. Anything you can do to sort this out, make this work? Right. And that was called appraiser influence. Gotcha. And so, so and that, that was pretty prevalent was back pretty in prevalent. the day. Yeah. 
Yeah. By the way, we're golfing on Saturday, buddy. Yeah, you want to yeah. come on out? Right. Yeah. Okay, so things magically happened back yeah. in the day. But you still had to have the data in the report to make it go. Okay. And if over time you were that guy that was known for pushing appraisals, okay. then you get a bad reputation and good lenders don't want to deal with you because if they have to take back a home that you've over appraised, oh. They're going to lose some money. Right. Not a good thing. Gotcha. So now we have to go through third parties, appraisal management companies. So we've got this firewall between us and the lender. We can't even talk to the lender. No. It's a violation. So we just go out and do our thing, which is good. But the management companies also take a portion of our fee. Ah. So so what do you think ha- has happened to appraisal fees? Well, they went up. Yeah. They went drastically. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. mean, I think a normal appraisal of Stormage County seems about, about 800 bucks. I imagine. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. So is Bellevue, Seattle, Redmond, are they still 800 bucks for these multi-million dollar homes or do they go up a bit more? Um, you know, that's really interesting. On an average. So, so multi-million dollar home, that's just a tract home now. Yeah, it is. So, <laughs> in those areas. yeah, and, and it's actually easier to, to appraise those than it is your acreage one okay. out, oh. out in Snohomish County. Okay. So that's why your appraisal fees literally are higher in a lot of instances. Wow. Because you've got this market that's just kind of a little bit wonky. Yeah. And it's harder to appraise. So uh, appraisal will be cheaper in, in Bellevue? Uh, oftentimes. Oh, yeah. damn. Yeah, I mean, All it right. can be because think of how many more cookie cutters yeah. we have. Yeah. We can churn and burn those. Yeah. Okay. But uh, you got to spend more time. You got to go to acreage. You got to go further out. Okay. And in, in, put more time into put it. Put more time into it. And in rural counties, say Okanagan County, appraisals even more because those guys got to drive forever for their comps. Oosh. Yeah. Forever. Yeah. You may drive 25, 30 miles for a comp. Wow. For one sale and then go 30 miles the other way. Wow. For your next comp. Right. So those guys charge more money because they've got more time into it. Fair enough. So, yeah, appraisal fees are anywhere from probably, there's probably guys out there doing it uh, for 500 bucks all the way up to, you know, 800 And then multifamily is typically over 1000 Yeah. And um, if you've got a complex upper end appraisal, you might be 1500 two grand, 2500 depending upon the complexity. Okay. If you've got a $10 million home on the waterfront, you're going to spend a lot of time putting that bad boy together because there's a lot of stuff to it okay a lot of components so now the lender i can't uh my the lender can't call you if you're in a queue um which that's all goodness because they, they broke that relationship and yep. so it is more of a neutral um but and that that only applies to fannie mae and freddie mac and like fha va fda or uh, usda loans Private lending, if a lender has their own money and this is not being backed by secondary mortgage market, if secondary mortgage market, this appraisal isn't going in as a uh, one of the documents on a mortgage-backed security, okay. you can do whatever you want. Oh, if okay. it's your money, okay. you can do whatever you want. Okay. You can call me. We can be best friends. Okay. You can take me golfing. Okay. <laughs> but because it's your money... You're going to want me to give you a real value. That is, uh, that's a, yeah, it's funny. It sounds yeah. like excited. Let's go golfing, Jim. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, that, so we do a lot of private money lending appraisals. We do a ton for private lenders. Okay. They're like the Builder Capital, Legacy Group Capital, Ascent Capital. These are big companies here in the Pacific Northwest. They have their own private lending pool. Okay. And they'll do fix and flips. They'll do remodels. and They'll do a lot of spec construction. So we do a lot of appraisals for those types of places because they want us to give them a real opinion of value. Right. Because it's their money on the line. Just like the lender. Yep. It's their investor's money. And they don't want to screw it up because then they got to go back and say, yeah, we got this inflated appraisal. Right. We had to take it back. Didn't work out. So sorry you lost all this money. That's a bummer, huh? Not a good thing. No. So back in the day, uh, uh, somebody could go get laid off from Boeing per se go get their real or appraiser uh, license uh, was it that easy back in the day for back in the day you didn't have a, a appraisal licenses really before the appraisal cr- licenses come about 1991 so during i the- started when there was no licensing wow. and what happened in 1989 firea federal financial institutions reform recovery enforcement act that's a mouthful. Yeah, it is. That came out of the SNL crisis. Thank you, government. Yeah. Remember, I don't know if you guys remember, but SNL crisis. Yeah. They were doing that, let's go golfing all 
day long. You could buy a federally backed savings and loan as your own piggy bank. All day long. All day long. Interesting. Like you got enough money, you go in and you buy a bank. You want to fund some of your own deals? You go buy a bank. Okay. So that's why we had FIREA. And part of FIREA was we're going to license these guys up. So each state did their own licensing. So I got licensed in 1992. It took a few years for the licensing in the individual states to do that. And so then that's when licensing started. I'm an appraiser is all you needed prior to the uh, early 90s. Okay. Then when you went to get, then when they redid the, made you get a license, what was required? It's about, it's, it's, it's slightly different now, but it's about the same. Uh, Back then, everybody was kind of grandfathered in. All right, you've been doing this a long time. We'll let you apply for this. Go do some hours, that kind of thing. But now you have to have 2,500 hours of trainee time with somebody who is your mentor and you have to have i think it's 120 hour clock hours and the 2500 hours of experience time has to be within a minimum of a two-year period can't be less than two years so you have to find somebody that you can train under and you're going to make all kinds of mistakes and you're not worth anything so they're going to pay you basically nothing wow and so just getting that trainee is very difficult and lenders up until recently because now we've got such a shortage of appraisers because they're basically old and they're all retiring there's such a shortage of appraisers that lenders are saying you know what we are now going to accept trainees working on the appraisals before they didn't want to have a trainees because if a lender has to take a property back and they have to explain to their their investors yeah we had an appraisal trainee (laughs) do this one so sorry it didn't work out it would be a good conversation we didn't have the best on the job that's a bummer isn't it those conversations don't work out so the senior appraiser the guy doing the training right He's still basically got to go out and look at every home. He's got to be there. He has to certify he's been there. He has to certify he's seen the exterior. So the trainee will go out and, and do the, the thing? And, and the senior appraiser. Wow. Okay. To put his name on it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Wow. Yep. We've got some lenders that will accept trainees kind of going out and doing that. But if you think about it, do you want to accept an appraisal that some guy who is not fully certified has done do you want to take on a a rookie appraisal rookie appraisal could be fine but if it's a complex property and the guy hasn't done very many appraisals as as a a representing a seller do you want a rookie appraiser coming out you want to have that conversation with that guy not really no so it's a catch-22 yeah getting more people into the industry making sure that they are qualified and going down that road. And right now we've got such a shortage. That's the main reason that appraisal fees have gone up. There's Supply and demand. Of appraisers. Wow. Do you see it going even worse? Oh, it's, it's getting worse right now. Because uh, the millennial generation doesn't want to work for peanuts to be a trainee. <laughs> well, I mean, in fairness, I mean, 2,500 hours. Yeah, and you have to have a college degree. You have to have a you four-year have four year degree. college That's, degree, too. You have to have a bachelor's degree. Wow. Yeah, you got to have a bachelor's degree. That is crazy to yeah, be an appraiser. To be an appraiser. So the just out of curiosity, what was? Do you ever see the need for the, the fall back on for that appra- that degree to be an appraiser? Do you ever? I think having like the statistics, having the okay. ac- accounting background, having economics, those that, kind of things super help. Yeah. But if you've got a degree in English, yeah, that's going to help you write the report, but it doesn't under- <laughs> help you understand value. No. Right. So. It's a, it's a barrier to Political entry. science. Yeah. And uh, the federal government basically said, okay, we're going to allow the states to reduce some of these requirements. What do you think Washington State said? No. Nope. Washington we're State is very these conservative. The same. Wow. We're going to keep these the same. So what did they allow them to lower down? It was the number of hours that you could get away with in a two-year period to get certified or licensed. And so there are three different classifications. There's state licensed. That allows you to appraise up to a million bucks. State certified is anything residential, a million bucks and over. And state general, that is commercial anything. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So you got to have a commercial license and have done basically trainee on commercial buildings, whether it's, you know, shopping centers, high rises, whatever. 
What's that? You're all three? No, just certified residential. We only handle residential. It's kind of like you're either one or the other. Oh. Because commercial is just, that's a different, it's a different world. Just like selling commercial real estate. Yeah, right. yeah different animal. And commercial, selling commercial real estate, wildly different than, than leasing commercial real estate. Yeah. Those guys are totally different too. Kind of like property managers versus what you guys do, which is sell residential. Right. How has COVID helped or hurt? appraisers oh interest rates have been incredibly low but what do you think Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac what do you think the federal government said about us going into homes facing COVID on a daily basis going into strangers homes that we know nothing about what do you think they said about the health of appraisers <laughs> we don't care you still got to go in we they had the ability to say you can do external only appraisals during the COVID you know what they said Nope, not so much. We don't want to have a conversation where we tell our investors, yep, there was COVID going down, didn't go see inside, that house is torn apart, sorry. So they put the appraiser's health on, at, on the line, and we've just gone in every day. Wow. You're so, still required to go in and take oh, your picks. mandatory. Wow. Mandatory. And appraisers have to go into the crawl space and the attic. Head and shoulders head and shoulders access. So literally, if I put this much of my body into the attic and the crawl space for like an FHA inspection, that's good enough. You shine your flashlight, whatever, take a look around. So maybe we'll do one more question and then we'll wrap up. So inventory demand, the lack of it <laughs> is killing the, isn't it making it, our jobs just that much harder? Inventory. Yeah, yeah, I think it makes it hard for everybody because real estate appraisers can't figure out what the value is. Mm -hmm. We don't have data to put our appraisals together. And you guys on the front lines of selling it have so many people who reach out and say, I don't really know what this is worth. And, you know, sometimes they come to me and I'm like, I don't know either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take my best guess and we're going to go with it. Yeah. And so often that is what happens because ultimately an appraisal is just – my professional opinion right. of what I think value is in and, that moment in time in a moment in time and I am off you know if I have good data I'm right on if I don't and if there hasn't been much out there I'm, right. I'm taking a guess and that's where real estate brokers probably have a better handle on what's going on because you guys are in the market every day selling right. hearing from people just about to put their homes on the market right what that looks like Whereas on the appraisal end, we are looking at historic data. All right, do you have some good rules of thumbs uh, to keep in mind when valuing a property? Keep the homes as similar as possible. Okay. Keep them as recent as possible. Close, close in, similar. The stuff that is the most similar, that is your best data. Don't compare apples to oranges. Okay. And just because something sold for more doesn't mean it's a good comp. It just means it's sold for more. Okay. That's, those are kind of the rules that I tell everybody because everybody always wants more. They want their house to be worth more. It's square footage and property acreage. How do you, I mean, if you've only got a 1,500 square foot house, but you got a half acre where a lot of the comps that you got to use, you don't have that half acre. Focus on the acreage because that's what a buyer is going to look for. Buyers are uh, uh, with a house that's on a 5,000 square foot lot but wants half acre, they're going to keep looking for half acre no matter what the house is because they want the privacy, the peace, the whatever, or maybe just the location. So basically, it's a home that. So if our home's on a half acre for a listing, we're going to command a bit. A premium pricing over our comps that are on the seven thousand yep. square foot. Yep, We're you're going to probably try and not compare apples to oranges. So go out as far as you need to to find those half acre comps. But if you don't have them, try and take a guess at what a buyer would pay for that premium. Yeah, and that's your adjustment. Yep, that's what we do. Twenty grand, twenty five grand, thirty grand. A bunch well that's where you go out and you take a look at uh kind of get an idea what property is going for right in that general area that general and then area. you just kind of you know all right let's wrap up thank you yeah well jim and denise scott of team scott oh, so what properties you're home yep Our <laughs>
<laughs> there we Team go. TeamScottHolmes.com. Thank you so much for coming on. These were really cool questions, and I would like to do this again. As you guys come up with questions, because I know you guys are really active on social media, right. keep reaching out. And when you have good questions, maybe write them down or shoot them to me. Okay. And I'll log them, and I'd love to have you guys in again. I would love to. And we'll talk about this stuff, because this is the stuff that other brokers want to hear. Yes. And I know it's not exciting, but it's kind of that day-to-day stuff. Good information. Of, all right, what do I do here? Yeah. Yeah. And you've kind of seen the mindset that the appraiser goes through and what we do. We so, greatly appreciate the opportunity to talk yeah, to you. Yeah, you bet. You bet. This you guys do a great great job selling for Summer Properties Northwest and Team Scott. So thanks again for coming on the podcast, Jim and Denise. Again, I'm Sean Reynolds from Summer Properties Northwest, Reynolds and Klein Appraisal. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll catch you in the next one. Bye. to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so you'll know when our next video is out.